Whether it's the devilish new characters, cryptic answers to ancient prophecies, or giant worms, the trailer for Doom Part 2 is full of details that you might have missed. It can be argued that the parent-child relationship between Lady Jessica and Paul may be one of the most dynamic in science fiction. Dune author Frank Herbert's characterization of Lady Jessica is nuanced, with her motives to conceive Paul being her desperate love of Duke Leto Atreides and her personal desire to bring about the Kwisatz Haderach, the universe's super-being. But as close as she and Paul are in the first film, the cracks begin to show when Paul realizes how his Bene Gesserit lineage has affected him. He still has a long way to go before achieving his destiny, but the closer he gets, the more it pushes him away from those who can understand him. Though Paul seems to believe that he must cling to his father's principles, he's already slipping. His visions have shown him that he will start an intergalactic holy war, and with Duke Leto not believing in revenge, it's fair to say he wouldn't approve of the genocide that Paul is seemingly destined to cause. This brings Paul in a turmoil, as he doesn't want to be capable of these unspeakable acts. But Jessica continues to push him, all while he starts pulling away from her influence. We gave them something to hope for. That's not hope! In the Doom Part 2 trailer, we see Lady Jessica gasping for air and opening her eyes, now the vibrant blue of the Fremen. This color change usually indicates prolonged exposure to spice, an addictive psychoactive substance found only on the planet Arrakis, considered the most valuable substance in the universe. However, the blood crusting Jessica's nose hints at a very specific source for her blue eyes. It's likely that this scene is part of a spice agony, a ritual in which members of the Bene Gesserit voluntarily ingest a poison known as the Water of Life, liquid harvested from sandworms that die from drowning. Although the Water of Life is fatal even in small quantities, high-ranking members of the Sisterhood are able to transform the substance into a benign liquid with their mental powers. This incredibly painful transformation unlocks a new level of power within those who survive, transforming them into a reverend mother. There's even a possible glimpse of the Water of Life a few seconds earlier in the trailer, held in a glass vial by a cloaked figure. Jessica's spice agony will probably play a major part in her story throughout Dune Part 2, and this is most likely our first glimpse. Princess Irulan is the eldest daughter of the Emperor of the Known Universe, but more importantly, anyone familiar with the Dune Saga will also be familiar with Irulan's work as a historian, with Herbert beginning a significant number of chapters with an epigraph from Irulan's professional writings. Typically, the passage will frame a notable historical event as it officially happened, and then the subsequent chapter will depict that same event as it actually happened. In this way, Urulam remains a consistent, prevalent force in Dune without really being present for all of the events of the story, not even physically appearing in the first book until the end. While the Warner Brothers film mirrors this by having Florence Pugh's princess making her debut in Dune Part 2, it also seems that her role has been expanded upon. The Irulan in the first book did as she was told and nothing more, a passive participant in her own life, though what she does later in this series is another story entirely. However, the movie version of Irulan seems to be actively asking questions and seeking answers. We can guess that director Denis Villeneuve is planning to tie Irulan more closely into the main plot, or he might be setting her up for future story arcs. Either way, it's safe to say that no one in their right mind would cast Pew in this part and not let her explore the space. The longest section of the Doom Part 2 trailer teases Paul's first ride on a sandworm. He places a thumper in the sand and readies for the massive creature's arrival. Over the montage, we can hear Zendaya's Shani. Have you ever had a dream about your first ride? This question is likely more somber than it initially seems. In the novel, by the time Paul experiences his first sandworm ride, he's had many visions of the future, and they're not all hopeful. In this scene, Shani is asking if he's foreseen how his first ride will go and whether or not he will survive. Paul is a bit nervous to ride the worm, and he knows that he's much older than most Fremen when they do so for the first time. Also, the continued trailer dialogue by Javier Badem Stilgar advising Paul how to ride Shai Halud is also pulled nearly word for word out of the book. The Doom Part 2 trailer shows us Fade Rautha Harkonnen, played by Austin Butler, in all his bold, treacherous glory. The great foil to Paul Atreides in the Doom novel, Fade is the nephew and intended successor of Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, played on screen in Dune Part 1 by Stellan Skarsgård. Fade bears the same drab, reptilian look as the rest of his vicious family, with most of his moments in the trailer shot in complete black and white. We see him participating in the gladiatorial arenas on Gady Prime, the Harkonnen homeworld glimpsed briefly in the first film. We also see an interaction with the Bene Gesserit, Lady Margot Fenring, played by Leia Sidhu. Finally, we see what appears to be a shot of Fade facing off against Paul, with Paul uttering the famous Fremen challenge, May thy knife chip and shatter. We won't spoil it here, but if you've already read the book, you know exactly what this moment leads to. 
The trailer gives the audience members their very first glimpse at Lady Margot. But though she becomes a major character later in the Dune book series, it seems her part in Villeneuve's film may have been expanded from her original role in the first novel. Margot is a member of the Bene Gesserit, the powerful matriarchal order who are partially responsible for the destruction of House Atreides on Arrakis. They've spent centuries orchestrating a selective breeding program to cross bloodlines of the universe's noble houses, and hope to mate Margot with Fade Ralther Harkonnen. This will give the secret organization a leg up, as they'll have a member of House Harkonnen fully in their control, doubling the amount of power in their possession. Book fans know that Margot's fate and Paul's are closely intertwined, and that ultimately Paul's rise will precipitate Margot's fall. But of course, this adaptation of Dune might switch things around a bit. For now, it's clear that Margot is here to stay. House Harkonnen has been a shadow on House Atreides from the opening moments of Dune Part 1. But if you thought the Baron was bad, just wait for Fade. Villeneuve told Vanity Fair, Austin Butler brought to the screen something that will be a cross between a psychotic sociopath serial killer and Mick Jagger. This features briefly in the trailer as Fade duels in an arena observed by Lady Margot. As we've said, the connection between the noble psychopath and the Bene Gesserit is significant. Established in the first film, the Bene Gesserit are intent on bringing about the Kwisatz Haderach through centuries of meticulous breeding. You were told to bear only daughters, but you in your pride thought you could produce the Kwisatz Haderach. Had Jessica given birth to a girl as was originally planned, the child would have eventually wed Fade in a political marriage, with their offspring likely being the Kwisatz Haderach. Now Paul is rising as a messiah of Arrakis cutting out the Harkonnens completely. But the Bene Gesserit don't appear to be giving up on the Harkonnens quite yet. The planet of Arrakis is foreboding and hostile, even for those who possess the technology to travel among the stars. The desert planet requires specialized skills and knowledge for someone to be able to survive. Although the planetary colonists of ruling noble houses struggle to cultivate spice, the Fremen, Arrakis's indigenous population, are well adapted, utilizing several novel technologies that allow their people to flourish. Thank you for the still suits. They are Fremen make. The best. Among their most notable items are Maker Hooks, featured prominently throughout the Dune Part 2 trailer. These hooks allow the Fremen to mount and steer the giant sandworms, and even though Paul is told not to show off during his first ride attempt, he's clearly quite good at it. Maker Hooks are important within Fremen culture because riding a sandworm is a rite of passage into adulthood. Fremen are able to use Maker Hooks to steer a sandworm by hooking into gaps in the sandworm's plating forcing the creatures to instinctively move in the opposite direction. Even though it looks like Paul is having fun in the Dune Part 2 trailer, this action means much more than possessing a skill in the eyes of the Fremen. Dune Part 2 will feature many characters on the hunt for Paul Atreides. As Princess Irulan's voiceover questions his fate after the Harkonnen attack, we get a glimpse of Josh Brolin's Gurney Harlech looking through a pair of binoculars. The editors have snuck in some clever imagery here since much of Gurney's story in the sequel will revolve around finding Paul and getting revenge on someone he thought he could trust. Even before the Harkonnen attack, Duke Leto knew there was a traitor embedded in House Atreides. In the novel, he even momentarily believed Jessica could be the culprit, given her status as a Bene Gesserit, and Gurney is likewise suspicious. Although audiences know Chang Chen's Dr. Yue was the traitor, Gurney hasn't learned that information and has continued to believe that Lady Jessica aided the Harkonnens. When we pick up with him in Dune Part 2, he's one of the few survivors of the original attack, searching Arrakis for Paul and vowing revenge on Jessica. While Gurney didn't have much to do in Dune Part 1, he still plays a significant role as one of Paul's major allies. Once the door to Paul's potential opens, it cannot be closed. His vision starts simply at first, with nightly dreams of Chani, whom he has yet to meet. But more and more his mind opens thanks to the spice, and soon he knows many things that he wishes he didn't. As his destiny is revealed, so is his mother's fate. Before Jessica even confirms that she's pregnant in Dune Part 1, Paul tells her of the baby she will have. In his mind, he sees Jessica's blue within blue eyes and her future facial tattoos. Though we can't definitively say what the tattoos mean, we can give a pretty accurate guess. Jessica has built her life around the Bene Gesserit and fulfilling the prophecy of the Kwisatz Haderach. A mind powerful enough to bridge space and time. Villeneuve told Vanity Fair, Lady Jessica is one of the masterminds of Dune. She's trying to play her own agenda. The meaning of that look would be unveiled in part two. It seems just as Paul comes to terms with his place in the universe, so too does Jessica. There are many mysterious forces in play throughout the galaxy depicted in Dune. Paul is the product of a long line of genetic manipulation for the express purpose of creating a superhuman, capable of leading humanity into a universal golden age. 
This Bene Gesserit breeding program cultivates each successive generation to possess greater acumen with their mental powers. One of the most notable powers is known as the voice. This skill is prominently seen and heard in Dune Part 1, when Jessica and Paul escape their assassination attempt during the Harkonnen coup. The power essentially allows its practitioners to mentally dominate most individuals. In the final moments of the Doom Part 2 trailer, Paul is addressing an assembly of Fremen. Although the music swells, one can hear some hint of the voice's distinct auditory cue, maybe implying that Paul uses the voice to rally the Fremen to his cause. <laughs> 